Hello and welcome to the Michael Mamas Show. I'm your host, Michael Mamas, and we're coming to you from Mount Soma, home of the Sri Sameshra Temple in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the real world of Jedi Knights. I imagine most all of you are aware of the uh, Star Wars movies uh, and the Jedi Knights, you know, with uh, Yoda. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll go into like, you know, what's, what's the real world? Uh, you know, it's interesting because, um, I used to do this exercise with my students in the classes and, um, well, it was just a way of getting them to kind of, uh, get around their, uh, really their indoctrinations and their programming as to, you know, what they think and, and just to kind of free up their minds um, so that they could, you know, start functioning in a manner that was just more consistent with um, uh, their capabilities, you know. And uh, so, so in that regard, a lot of our, our education. Who was it, Scotty? Do you, do you remember who said that, you know, I think it might have been uh, Edison or Einstein or one of those guys who said I spent, or maybe it was even Mark Twain, I spent the last half of my life trying to forget what I learned in the first half. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a, a playful. Mark Twain. <laughs> was that Mark Twain? I said it sounds like him. You know? Yeah, it does. It sounds like him. Yeah. Anyway, uh, um Science fiction is an interesting arena too, because like Jules Verne and different people like that, they, they, they write sci-fi and really writing sci-fi is just a way of sort of freeing up your mind. And so you write things, he wrote about submarines and different things. And, and it turns out later on, technology uh, catches up and a lot of things they were thinking of just as purely imagination turn out to be real technologies. And uh, uh, I think if you look at um, the Star Wars trilogy, just as an example, uh, they talk about, you know, Jedi Knights. And of course, they, they, they turn all very much into Hollywood stuff. And uh, uh, so it becomes like a uh, glorified version of the real world notion of what Jedi Knights are. But but the, they are kind of Hollywood sort of, Bollywood sort of takeoffs on um, something that in a much more pragmatic sense, but really a more, uh, in a lot of ways, a more dramatic sense uh, is, is a very real thing. And so we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, and what is the real world? What is the real world Jedi Knight? You know, what's that really about? And, and they're out there. And uh, they're a lot closer than you may think, you know. And so uh, uh, we'll take a look at that. Um, but before we get into that, I think it's important to take a kind of a look at, you know, what it's not. <laughs> um, you know, there's this song uh, that uh, John Lennon, one of the Beatles wrote. It's called Imagine, isn't it? I guess that's the title of it, Imagine. And he talks about, you know, imagine there's no heaven uh, above you, only sky and uh, no hell below you, um, nothing to live or die for. Wasn't that in there, Scotty? Um, yeah, no countries. No country. Yeah. And uh, I remember this was when was it? Back around 1980, I guess, when John Lennon died, when he was shot. And uh, I remember that, you know, some of the people I was around, they, they mourned like it was the death of a great saint, you know. And uh, I mean, he was a great musician, you know, he wrote a lot of great songs and stuff. But I remember I made the comment, I said, well, you know, he was a really good musician, but I said that, you know, he wasn't like a saint or a guru or anything like that. 
And they were just appalled at my comment. And uh, I was kind of shocked, really. I mean, they deified this guy. And I mean, his song, and I, I don't mean to offend it. I mean, maybe I'm going to offend a lot of the listeners. I don't know if I am or not. But the, the song was so, really, if you look at the concepts, the song was created by somebody on a drug trip, it sounded to me like. I mean, no heaven, you know, just, it's just not the way the world is. It's not the way the world is meant to be in, in the uh, fully enlightened world. It's not the way the world is going to be. Uh, there is such a thing as heaven. Now, granted, heaven is not uh, probably the way a lot of us have, have been led to believe in our religions or whatever. And I mean, that's a, I do whole lectures and stuff about heaven and hell and what it is and what it's not. And, you know, God is not some guy sitting on a cloud up there, obviously, but but uh, uh, I think a big reason why people are rejecting religion, in fact, is because uh, the notions of um, spirituality and religion and all that, um, that a lot of people were uh, introduced to in their childhood and that uh, just aren't accurate, you know. Uh, but the antithesis of it that I think is represented in the song Imagine, no, well, that's not it either. That's just, it's a drug trip, you know. Um, but it's interesting, like in, in the uh, Star Wars trilogy or however many there are out there now, the Star Wars movies, uh, one of the reasons people really relate to it, I think. And also, what was the other one? The Matrix, especially the first one. People really related to that. And why? Because even though it's um, tangential to a deeper reality, just like with the Jules Verne um, novels, it speaks to, perhaps loosely, but nevertheless, it speaks to a deeper reality, a deeper truth. Uh, and so that's what we, we want to uh, get to today with respect to uh, a, what is a Jedi Knight? What is a real Jedi Knight? And they're out there. Uh, and, and so we're going to relate it to the, to the Veda. And what are the Jedi Knights of the, you know, the, what the ancient seers knew, uh, the ancient secrets of the Veda? Uh, and I think, you know, particularly for those of you who... Um, have been listening to these podcasts and we've talked about the structure of the Veda. We've talked about uh, uh, Apurusheya, that which is not of the relative, of the manifest, not uh, commonly they refer to that as not man-made, but it's way more than that. It's, it's not of the relative, it's not of the manifest, it's absolute, it's, it's um, uh, uh, in the absolute, it's uh, Chaitanya, if you will. Uh, it's the pure Veda, you see. And um, uh, so within the Veda, you know, there are the four Vedas, Rig, Sama, Yajra, or like, or Rig, Sama, Yajra, like that, and, and uh, uh, Thara Veda. But what, within that, there's, there's Yajra Veda, which is what we're going to talk about today, because Yajra Veda deals with... Um, uh, how do we want to say it? It's um, it involves uh, the the use of mantras. Uh, most of the pundits that that you um, see when you go to the temples are they're they're yajurveda pundits because they they deal with the technology, if you will, of uh, the implementation of mantras, and so they're uh, they're the ones that are doing the ceremonies. Uh, 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 that create uh, predicted outcomes, if you will. Their their uh, implementations of the technologies for s specific reasons. If you go to a uh, temple and have a uh, I don't know a um, 
Saturn Puja done or something, you're going to probably you're going to be seeing a Yajur Veja pundit, and he's going to be doing a ceremony for a predicted result. Now, so so that's Yajur Veda. Now, each of the four Vedas has a corresponding Upa Veda. Upa uh, Upa Veda means it's kind of like well, you can translate Upa as kind of like lesser, but Maybe a better way to say it in this context would be um, it's like the manifest, if you will, the the uh, Porsche uh, manifest versus a Porsche absolute. Uh, uh, Porsche I mean manifest correlation uh, to that uh, part of the Veda. So the a Porsche correlate to the Porsche Yajur Veda is called Donner Veda. Donner Veda, interestingly enough, and you see all these different things, particularly the Sanskrit language lends itself very much to the di different levels of meaning. So if you were to read a translation, if you will, uh, or an interpretation, if you will, of any aspect of Veda, it's going to be usually addressed on a particular level, and there are much deeper levels. But uh, with respect to Donner Vade, it's usually done oftentimes in terms of archery or uh, martial arts. Uh, now, isn't it interesting that the correlate then in the manifest to a technology within the absolute which is the technology, it's like a technology of the unified field, how to elicit a particular result, how to um, align a particular aspect of life with natural law, so that if there's, you know, a difficulty or something like that, or something that's desired or something like that, but it's not working because there's some disharmony, that uh, things can get realigned, so that there can, so that the uh, desired result can manifest. It's just a matter of living in harmony with nature. You see, the idea is that it's inherent in our nature. the The whole purpose of manifest existence is the extension of happiness, the fulfillment of all desires, uh, disharmony, lack of fulfillment, frustration, all of that. Conflict, all of that comes from lack of harm, not lack of harmony, living in, in lack of harmony with nature. You see, so realignment with nature, you see, uh, is what brings about uh, fulfillment, abundance, peace, peace. Now, so isn't it interesting that Donnerve? which is the manifest correlate to Yajurveda, is a, a technology that, which is on one level translated, interpreted as um, martial arts. Now, there are different levels of martial arts, aren't there? And, you know, it's interesting because even in, uh, you know, your kung fu movies and um, uh, what, uh, Karate Kid or... Uh, uh, the, the Bruce Lee movies and things like that, they always kind of talk about the spiritual component and they'll talk about, uh, uh, you know, they always allude to it's not about beating people up, it's there's a deeper knowledge to it that they reference. And also, what was the guy's name, Scotty, with Aikido, the, the, the Aikido master, and it was, it, it was such a beautiful flow, you know. Uh, Hmm? Yeah. Um, well, the the popular movie star guy was that. Uh, and there was an action star. Um, oh was, yeah, and I'm not thinking of him. I'm talking about <laughs> the guy that originated it. He was Japanese, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. What was his name? I can't remember. You know, I went to uh, 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 when I was teaching classes in California. One of the students was a. Uh, uh, they have a name for him, but a uh, an Aikido master. Very nice guy, and he invited me to his. Uh, they have names for all this dojo or whatever, and because uh, he was doing a, a demo, 
and there were a bunch of different uh, Aikido teachers that were there and a bunch of students and he was going to demo uh, uh, the art of Aikido with um, the different teachers. And so he got up and uh, one at a time that different teachers would like, you know, attack him. And it was really interesting to watch. And oh, and then he had me get up and read, you know, energetically what was going on uh, as they attacked him. And it was very interesting because, you know, different people uh, have different psychodynamic structures and the psycho, the psychodynamic structure of their physiology, you know, even on the gross physical level correlates to the energetic level, which correlates to the chakras and which chakras they run most of their energy through and stuff like that. And he, he, that wasn't his arena. His arena was more, you know, just reading what was coming at him and, you know, maybe he'd call it energy. I don't know what he'd call it, but at any rate, uh, uh, The way he would do it, uh, I'm trying not to put words in his mouth, but so just from my perspective, when I watched and when I read it to the group as he was, you know, working with these people one at a time, like there was this one person I remember, a lot of energy in her head, you know, uh, spirituality current, we call them, a lot of energy up here. And uh, when, when she came at him, he took his hand and he would just kind of like go around her head, not touch her, but just kind of go around her head and step to the side and she would kind of go like that and fall down. And he didn't even have to touch her because he's kind of like with his hands, he kind of hooked that, that energy and she fell down. It was beautiful to watch, really remarkable to watch. And then another guy who was just big, hefty, strong, I don't know, husky guy, you'd say. And uh, he came charging at him. And uh, this Aikido master kind of stepped to the side and kind of went like this. And again, I don't even, I, maybe he touched, I can't remember. But he just kind of took this guy's powerful force, kind of had him and just kind of hooked it a little bit. How did he apparently touch the guy? And the guy fell down. And every single guy that, every single person, some were women, some were men, that came at him, it, it was like that. It was graceful and beautiful to watch. But um, uh, the, the point being though, that it wasn't about brute, crude physical force, but it was the art of archery. And what does archery involve? Archery involves uh, all the subtle components of you know the wind, the angle of the uh, uh, arrow, where, where it's pointed, uh, uh, how far back you draw the bow, the, the, just the whole thing. It's a whole multivariable equation that is just spontaneously aligned with, uh, just like this guy did with uh, the, the Aikido, you know? And that's, and still that's, it's, it's not the super gross level, but it's still within the physical arena going in, entering into the energetic, you know, but now the real Jedi masters, who are the real Jedi masters? The real Jedi masters uh, aren't the Don Veda guys, except that you see, it's a continuum and to really master Don Veda, what you're really doing, everything comes out of the transcendent it has to be fully integrated with the transcendent. But the real um, uh, uh, Star Wars, what do you call them, uh, Jedi Knights are the ones that function purely on the um, uh, Yajur Veda level. And that's all an impl uh, the implementation of mantras. And, the, and those are the guys we call those the Yajur Veda pundits. And, 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 and those guys, the, 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 the very DNA of their physiologies have been cultivated. And that's called a, see the caste system usually is thought of in a very wrong way. The caste system, when we speak of Brahmins, isn't because, you know, of some social order, it's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with the, the um, DNA of their physiology itself, which is such that it resonates on a particular level, very deep level within the transcendent so that they can implement that technology of mantras on that deepest level 
so that they can employ these um, ceremonies, if you will, these pujas, you know, these yagyas like that, uh, uh, so that they can actually navigate, negotiate, and employ these technologies on the deepest level of existence. And the, the deeper something goes, the more subtle it goes. And it can even go basically unnoticed by somebody functioning on a, a cruder level, you know, but nevertheless, that's the technology of the unified field. And that's the real technology that's really going to affect the, the fundamental changes of existence that can bring about um, major changes in, in the universe that can do it on an individual level, but even more importantly, you can, importantly, you can do it uh, on the level of, of the universe, you see? And uh, uh, those are, those are Yadra Veda pundits. Uh, and, and they operate the temples, but now here's, a, here's an interesting thing to show you just how far this goes and how, how highly elusive and, 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 and that it goes. I talked about, you know, an enlightened city. And I remember once I was talking about uh, enlightened cities and how there isn't one anywhere on the planet right now. Somebody wrote in and they said, well, what about Angkor Wat in uh, Cambodia, right, Scotty? Yeah. Angkor Wat. You've probably seen it comes up on the news sometimes. If not, you can uh, search it online, you know, A-N-G-K-O-R space W-A-T. Incredible complex, and it looks pretty much like an enlightened city, at least the temple complex would look. Uh, uh, and they, they said, well, what about Angkor Wat? And I said, no, that's it's not an enlightened city. Why? It's not even operational. It's not even functioning. It's all overgrown with weeds and stuff. And if you look at the history of Angkor Wat, it's really very interesting. And it speaks to the delicacy of the technology and how easily it's compromised. Angkor Wat was originally a Vedic temple. And let's just assume at one time it was an enlightened city. What happened was that at some point in its history, uh, it ceased to be Vedic. And what happened is uh, it, it, uh, it, it kind of got taken over by a Buddhist group. Now, nothing wrong with Buddhists. They have their technology. But but it's, it's, it's a little bit like if you take a... Uh, Ford F-150 carburetor, or let's say a Porsche carburetor, and stick it in a Ford F-150, won't work. It's because they're different technologies. And so the minute you do that, you've got a structure, a Sakaki Vedic, you know, a Vedic structure, and you're employing a different um, set of mantras, a, a different set of ceremonies in it, and there's a mismatch there, done, finished. It's that subtle. And even in um, uh, even in Vedic temples, even in Hindu temples, the, the technology is extremely delicate. I know I was talking to a Stapati Veda, another one of the Upavedas, and and uh, and he was saying that uh, in, in the past there have been Vedic temples, and and even within that, you know, there's even within the uh, arena of automobiles, there's Porsches and there's uh, Ford F-150s and you can't just mix the carburetors from one to the other. Even though they're both based on, you know, in, internal combustion engines, it's different. And, and, uh, and so like that, um, they'll have a nice Vedic temple and then a couple generations down the line, a king wants a particular statue, a Murti, uh, and they, take that Morty and they stick it in the temple, but it's a different uh, 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 design. Let's say it's a Porsche Morty stuck into a Ford F-150 temple and it throws the whole thing off. And so the, the technology is extremely delicate and has to be honored, you see. Now back to Angkor Wat, I understand at one point a, a king came along and the, the, heart, the heart of a Vedic building, be it a temple or even a home or whatever, the heart of it is called the Brahmastan. And, and it's like, it's the heart, you know, the center of the thing. And uh, the king at one point decided that, well, when he dies, he wants to be buried in the most powerful place he can. So he decided that he wanted... He wanted his coffin to be placed in the Brahmastan of Angkor Wat. 
I mean, it's hard for me to even say that out loud, you know, but it just speaks to the fact that, you know, and that's why I say it's a little bit like, it's one thing to build a really fine Stradivarius violin. It's another thing to play it properly, you see? And it just speaks to how delicate the knowledge is. Uh, that's why they say that, you know, in India, they even say that it's not even appropriate to make loud noises around an enlightened master. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, an enlightened master is so powerful and everything, why would it matter? Well, it's because their physiology is so refined, you see? So, you know, there's so much that just of the knowledge that's important and it, it just gets lost and, and, and misunderstood, you know? Um, and all this is just so important, important to know. Now, so now we have um, these Brahman uh, Yajur Veda pundits and, and they're in there and they're running a Vedic temple. They're doing their mantras and they're doing all these ceremonies every day. And it's all prescribed it's very precise technology, far more sophisticated technology than, you know, how to build and operate a cell phone, for example, or a computer. You know, why? Because it's a deeper, it's a more delicate uh, technology. Uh, and that's their job. They're Brahmin pundits. But now there's a lot too. And, and this is something that's not really um, that recognized, particularly in the West. In India, it's, it's better known. And, and, and that is that um, it's a principle. And it's just like with magnets, you know, these principles, again, things exist on different levels. And the one principle is positive attracts negative. And, uh, uh, and you can express that in different ways, but we can just leave it at that or, you know, or saying in another way, right now it's Kali Yuga, you know, there's a certain mentality and it's not really an enlightened mentality that dominates the earth. And so if you create a Vedic temple that's generating, you know, unified field, divine principles are radiating and out to the environment, that's going to be a threat to the other mentality. They're going to look at it and they're going to reject it. They're going to judge it for whatever reason, and they're going to attack it. Positive attracts negative. North and South Pole of a magnet, same idea. Uh, and so what happens then is that you need that's the idea of a government structure that's an ideal government now but see in, in this day and age even the governments become corrupt don't they but in an ideal structure that's that's the role of what's called a kshatriya and a, a warrior and kshatriyas are like um uh well rulers kings government officials military but, but now we, we even hesitate to use those words don't we because the whole thing is so corrupt but in an in a ideal age, in an ideal format, those are the guys that protect the integrity of the culture. Uh, and we have all those words like honor, integrity, you know, what, what are the different things, you know? Uh, um, uh, that, what are the different things, you know, Scotty, that we say with respect to the military, the, the ideal values that they uphold, you know, um, it's funny, I can't think of the things right now. You know, like things like honor and integrity. I don't know. <laughs> Hard to, to think that now. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. the people. <laughs> it comes, it seems keeps coming. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because the the, the 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 people in the military that I've met, uh especially especially like uh just the regular military people, so many of them that I've met really uphold those high laudable values, you know? Yeah. But, but it, it almost seems like what's, what the um, military industrial complex has done with them is just, it's horrible, you know? Well, now it's finally transitioning out of all of that old guard that came out of World War II Korea, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Now, none of the the guys that are leading are the ones that um, are now were in like the Iraq War. So there's like a whole new genre of of military leaders now. 
all those the old it's gonna go back to the the noble leaders the really people who honor and have the integrity you know well, it they're... will it, it it's happening at any rate at any rate the the point being that it's 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 in, in an ideal civilization it's the kshatriyas that protect the culture protect the society and protect protect the brahmin pundits that uphold the whole thing and particularly in the transition period when we're going from a kali yuga like we are now to a sat yuga right now because in and that's why they say that it's uh, uh Tremendous karma is incurred uh, when a Shiva temple is built, for example, because the, the, the negative is attacking the positive. And it's the role then of the leader of an enlightened city, birthing an enlightened city, to protect the temple, protect the uh, 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 Yajurveda pundits, the pundits, uh, 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 and to sort of be like the tip of the arrow. arrow but uh, to bring forth all, all of that uh, in its purity. Michael, you know? how, how do we do this, though? Because it seems like in our society now, whoever has the best marketing program is the one that gets there. That's part it of the challenge, but Scotty. That's part of the challenge. Because, because, you know, there's so much that has to be pierced. There's so much that has to be overcome. Uh, and, and a lot, even the left-handed Tantra thing that we talked about. Uh, uh, there's, you know, left hand. that's like in, in uh, the whole Star Wars trilogy, it's, or the whole Star Wars series, it's right there too, isn't it? The dark side and the allure of the dark side. Uh, and and uh, in, in the, um, we've talked about that as, you know, left-handed Tantra and it's alluring, you've got, you know, quick results, dramatic results quick fix, but huge karma comes along with it. And that's what you're talking about there, Scotty. That's all left-handed tantric stuff, black magic, you know? But even and so that's another thing that it's the role, you know, it's interesting that uh, Lord Krishna in the Mahabharata, he wasn't a Brahmin. He was a Kshatriya. He was a warrior. It was his job, if you will, to usher in um, the next yuga. And he was the protector of all of, all of that. He was the upholder of all that dharma. He was, it was, it, and, it, and it was the role of a kshatriya then to, to bring that forth. It's a battle. Uh, um, was it, what, were they able to recognize it then? Because it brings me back to what you've talked about before. It's, yeah, go ahead. Jesus, you know, <laughs> they, they didn't recognize him. They nailed him to the cross, you know? Well, that's the point. You know, when you say they, the question is who? Right. Who is they? You know, because, um, you know, it's only in the Hollywood movies when the bad guys recognize themselves as bad guys, usually. You know, usually it, the bad guys think they're good and think they're on this side of the right, particularly when it comes to the hordes following the bad guys. You know, uh, just like now with Democrats and Republicans, most of the Democrats think they're good guys. Most of the Republicans think they're the good guys, you know? And so it's, it's and, and uh, uh, you know, there was the, like even with Lord Krishna, my gosh, you know, there's Lord Krishna. And there's that one person that just hated Krishna, just hated him. All he could think about is how much he hated Krishna. And when the guy died, he went straight to heaven. Why? Because all he thought about his whole life was Krishna. You know, so the whole thing is pretty is pretty convoluted. You know, it's 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 very subtle and it's very elusive. Uh, and now with um, Mount Soma, you know, we're not just building one Shiva temple. We already did that. We're wanting to build an enlightened city, hugely powerful. You know. Uh, and so tremendous challenge, you know, it's a formidable task to build a, a one Shiva temple, but to build a whole enlightened city, huge wave of positivity attracts a huge wave of negativity. And, uh, all we can do is steady hand on the rudder, keep going, protect and uphold our, our pundits 
and uh, uh, just keep going, you know. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, the wave of um, karma, if you will, is uh, going in the right direction. Now, now is the time. This is the time of the transition from Kali Yuga into a period of Sat Yuga. And so really we're riding that, riding that wave. And it's really a matter then of just um, bringing that transition about as smoothly as possible. It will happen. It's just a question of how smoothly, you know. And so that's what we're about. Um, uh, and so the real, the real um, uh, Jedi Knights of the universe are the Vedic pundits, particularly the Yajur Vedic pundits. I mean, all the pundits are great. All these just being around them is awesome, you know. But uh, uh, the Ayurveda pundits are the ones that are employing the technology. Uh, and uh, they're the ones that are running the, the temples. But uh, when we have the whole enlightened city, I, I definitely want to have, you know, all four Vedas represented, absolutely. And of the four, really, my favorite, it, I th just to listen to them chant is just so incredible, the Samaveda pundits. Some of it, uh, you know, I talked to Yajur Veda as a technology with the ceremonies and all that. Uh, some of it is, uh, you could say more, it might be like um, um, worship or uh, praise or whatever. And you can go online and search some of it and listen to the pundits chant. It's so beautiful. It just flows. Sama, like Soma, you know, and uh, uh one thing, though, when you go online and listen to Samaveda pundits or any kind of pundits, um, a lot of times you're, what you're listening to is sort of a takeoff on it. The pure Samaveda, the pure Yajurveda is, is exquisite. But sometimes, you know, people are doing things that don't take off and putting it to music and stuff. Uh, so if you do go online, and tr you'll get some sense of it at least. But, um, but really the pure... Vedic chants, Samaveda, it just, it's just like nectar, you know. Uh, anyway, I think that gives you an idea of uh, what it's about and, you know, I think that's enough for now. Anything else to the, all this, Scotty? No. I think that pretty much covers it. All right, everybody, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll talk with you again next week. You take care for now.